Okay, welcome to part two of lectures nine and 10. We're gonna cover the upper digestive tract and swallowing today. Let's first start with the mouth, which is also called the oral or buccal cavity. This is pronounced like a belt buckle. And let's just first start with the functions of the mouth. We talked about one of the major functions of the digestive system in general, and this was ingestion. And of course, this is carried out by the mouth when we take in food. The other important function of the mouth is mechanical digestion, and we term that mastication. It's the same thing as chewing. And of course, this is really accomplished by the teeth that are in the gums. And what mastication does is it prepares the food for further chemical digestion by breaking the food up into smaller particles so that enzymes will have more surface area to work with. Now let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of the mouth. And we see the entire oral cavity here surrounded by the lips. Each lip is known as a labium, so plural is labia. And you'll notice that the lips are basically the terminal end of the orbicularis oris muscle. And the lips themselves are very thin skin that don't have any sweat glands or sebaceous glands in them, so they have to be kept moist. And you'll notice that each lip is attached to the gums or the gingiva via these frenula. One of these is called a frenulum. We have one here on the top. And the one on the bottom that's down here is known as the lingual frenulum because it's connected to the tongue. Inside the lips, you'll see the gums, which are the gingiva. These are here. We're going to talk about these in a little while in connection with the teeth. And then you see the teeth that are in the bone of the jaws. Now, inside the oral cavity itself, on the bottom, we see the tongue. Below the tongue, as we said, we see the lingual frenulum. And down here are actually openings for salivary glands. Two salivary glands in particular, the sublingual and the submandibular salivary glands, which we're going to talk about in a little while. If we go to the upper portion of the oral cavity, you see a number of soft tissues in here. On the top, we have the hard palate. And if you remember, the hard palate was composed of the palatine process of the maxillary bone in the front, as well as the palatine bone in the back. And this is, of course, covered by the membrane that's in the mouth, the mucous membrane that's here. This is a stratified squamous epithelium that covers the roof of the mouth. And you'll notice that the soft palate, which is in the back, hanging down from that, we have this structure right here, which is known as a uvula. We'll talk about the functions of the uvula in a couple of seconds. Toward the back of the oral cavity, you can see a couple of tonsils, which are right here. These are known as palatine tonsils. We also have one that we can't see because it's behind the uvula that's known as a pharyngeal tonsil. Now, in the back of the oral cavity, we also see these folds of tissue back here. These are known as fauces and the oropharynx is right back here. So all this space back here is called the oropharynx. So this exists at the back of the oral cavity. Now let's talk a little bit more about the tongue. You'll see the functions of the tongue on the bottom here. The tongue houses the taste buds. So this allows us to taste the food. Also provides some friction for food handling and also secretes something called lingual lipase. And of course you'll recognize that this is an enzyme that digests fats. Now the tongue is actually anchored to the hyoid bone at the back. This is a very muscular organ. The muscles run in several direction. And in fact, the tongue has intrinsic as well as extrinsic muscles. And this is all covered by mucous membranes. Now in this diagram that you see at the left, you'll see we have a back portion of the tongue, which is called a root. Generally this portion that goes from right here at this groove back is known as the root of the tongue and the body of the tongue is the front part that's forward of that groove, which is right in here where I'm drawing. On the tongue, we have several different kinds of projections. Some of these are known as filiform papillae. The filiform papillae are basically providing friction and manipulating foods. We also have some fungiform papillae that are scattered widely over the tongue. And each one of them has a vascular core that gives it more or less a reddish kind of color. And we have 10 to 12 large valet papillary. We have foliate papillae. And these are taste buds. And as we said, the other function of the tongue is to secrete lingual lipase, which is a fat digesting enzyme. We have some serous cells just beneath the foliate and valet papillae that secrete this enzyme. Now, a little bit more about the palate. Here we get a good view of the hard palate. Okay, this is a, a review from ANP1. You remember, once again, this is the palatine process of the maxillary bone that's in the front right up to about here and in the back the small portion here is known as the palatine bone and that forms the hard palate and of course this is covered by the epithelium inside the oral cavity now at the back of the palate we have the soft palate which is all of this that you see right here 
And at the very back of the soft palate, we have a structure that's known as the uvula, which is boxed in red here. This is very important in separating the nasopharynx from the pharynx during swallowing. And what the uvula will do during swallowing is move back up this way so that it will block entrance of the food back up into the nasopharynx and the nasal cavity and will direct the food down into the oropharynx, down into the laryngopharynx, and eventually down into the esophagus, leading down to the stomach. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the teeth. Let's start with the secondary or permanent teeth. Now, these are adult teeth. These are after the baby teeth have fallen out. And typically, we have about 32 secondary teeth. You'll see a numbering scheme here that we use. We start on the right upper jaw with number one and move around the teeth this way, as you see, to number 16. So the 16 teeth in the top jaw. And then starting on the left, once again, on the lower left, we go from 17 over to 32 in the lower jaw. This is basically the numbering scheme that, uh, for example, dentists might use. What I'd like you to know, however, is the type of teeth and their position in the jaws. And you notice that we basically have four different sets of these teeth. So we have, for example, in the upper jaw on the right side, we have one set of these. On the upper jaw on the left side, we have one set of these. On the lower jaw on the left, we have one set. And on the lower jaw on the right, we have one set. So we have four sets of these four different types of teeth. The first kind of teeth that we see are incisors. This one is called a central incisor. This is called a lateral incisor. And these teeth are basically act like chisels so that we can kind of cut the meat or whatever we're eating. The second type of tooth that we have that's lateral to the incisors is known as a cuspid. Sometimes this is also known as a canine tooth. These are more fang-like teeth that are designed for gripping, kind of tearing things that we're eating. Following that, we have the bicuspids. These are also called premolars. And typically there are two of these here. And then finally in the back, we have the molars. The molars are these three teeth that you see here. Typically the last molar that fills in later in life is known as a wisdom tooth. So people may or may not have the wisdom teeth come in. They may or not be a problem. Some people have to have them removed. Some people don't. Depends on how they come in, uh, whether they come in straight, whether they're impacted, and how they affect the other teeth in the jaw. So we have the incisors in the front, the cuspids or canines next, the bicuspids or premolars after that, and the molars after that. Perhaps a good mnemonic to remember these, if you know what an intercontinental ballistic missile is, that's an ICBM, this is incisors, cuspids, bicuspids, molars. Another way of remembering this is this little silly phrase here, I see big pretty molars. This would of course stand for incisors, cuspids or canines, bicuspids or premolars, and finally molars. So maybe this will help you remember these a little bit more. Now the next type of teeth that we want to look at are the primary, which are also called deciduous baby or milk teeth. These are the first teeth that come in. And if you remember from Anatomy and Physiology 1, when we looked at the fetal skull and sort of the infant skull, the jaw is shorter in a fetus and infant, and so it grows during childhood to accommodate more teeth. So initially, a child can only accommodate about 20 teeth total. And this is the breakdown of the teeth that are in the child's jaw. And eventually what happens is when the secondary teeth that we just looked at begin to come in, the roots of these teeth start to be dissolved away and these teeth begin to fall out, and then the tooth fairy comes. The primary teeth that we're looking at here are the first teeth to appear. They generally start appearing around age six months, and usually the lower central incisors are the first one to come in. Uh, additional pairs of teeth start to come out about one to two month intervals until about 24 months, when by that time about all 20 of the deciduous teeth have emerged. Now let's talk next about the anatomy of a tooth and take a look at the different parts of uh, teeth. The tooth has two main portions to it. There's a crown, which exists above the gum line. These are the gums right here, the gingiva. And then the root, which lies below the gum line. Now, a couple of different parts we want to look at. First of all, you'll notice this top covering on the tooth here, which is known as the enamel of the tooth. This is the portion of the tooth that we actually see. The enamel is a very hard material. It's brittle, ceramic-like material that really bears the brunt of the force of chewing. It's really the hardest substance in the body, even harder than bone. It has hydroxyapatite in it, just like the bone does, as we talked about before. The columns in this are basically oriented so that they resist the forces uh, that we put on them when we chew. The problem is that as we age, there are no cells to rejuvenate the enamel, so the enamel that we have as adults is pretty much the enamel that we're going to have. 
and if we chip it or crack it or something like that it has to be repaired because it can't be replaced. The material that's immediately beneath that is known as dentin and this is a protein rich bone like material and it really forms the bulk of the tooth as you see here in this diagram. It's more resilient than the enamel and it actually acts as a shock absorber during biting and chewing. Now you'll notice that the dentin also surrounds the pulp cavity and down the bottom surrounds the root canal as well. So all the material out here that you see in yellow is the dentin. This actually can be replaced. It can be repaired because there are cells in here that have these small tunnels that actually make the dentin and can replace some of the dentin. Inside the tooth, you'll notice that we have a pulp cavity. This contains blood vessels and nerves, lymphatics. And then on the bottom, you'll see a root canal. Now you probably know that a root canal is also a dental procedure in which this whole pulp cavity and the root canal is drilled out so there's no more nutrition basically to the cells in the dentin so effectively the tooth is dead then there are some antibiotics that are put in here for temporarily and then what has to happen is since the tooth is dead there has to be a crown an artificial crown put on the surface of the tooth so that the enamel and the other portion of the tooth that's left behind doesn't break you'll also see once again the gingiva or the gums that come up and have a small groove at the portion here which is known as the neck of the tooth and then down the bottom of the tooth you'll notice we have this layer of what's called sometimes cement sometimes this is also called cementum and this is a calcified connective tissue that covers the outer surface of the root and really attaches the tooth to the thin periodontal ligament which you see right here and the periodontal ligament are strands of connective tissue that anchor the tooth into the bone of the jaw Hopefully you remember this from a and 1. We talked about this periodontal ligament and we gave it a name when we were talking about the joints. Remember this was called a gomphosis. This is the only example of a gomphosis that we saw in the body. So what I'd like you to be able to do is to label any of the parts of this diagram on the exam. Okay, let's talk a little bit about saliva and the functions of saliva. One of the main functions of saliva is to moisten the food that we take into our mouth. Very important because we have to moisten the food for a couple of reasons. Number one, we want to bind the food particles together in the mouth so that we can form it into a bolus that can be eventually swallowed, which we'll talk about in the next couple of slides. The other important function of saliva is that it dissolves food for tasting. The taste buds or taste pores that we talked about before actually don't detect food molecules unless they're dissolved in saliva. So without any saliva in the mouth, we wouldn't be able to taste the food. Very importantly, there's also an enzyme in saliva called amylase, salivary amylase, that begins chemical digestion of complex carbohydrates. And that's the abbreviation CHO here. The saliva is very important also in cleaning the teeth and the mouth. It provides a continuous washing away of things in the mouth and getting rid of, for example, bacteria, food particles, those sort of things. And you'll notice that the pH is essentially about neutral, maybe slightly acidic. And this really is genetically determined. Many people have acidic saliva. Many people also have basic saliva. So it really depends uh, somewhat on genetics, but the pH is in a range of about 6.5 to 7.5. And finally, the saliva is very important because it also contains some antimicrobial substances, such as IgA. The IgA, if you remember from the immune lectures, this was a type of antibody that we found in mucosal surfaces. And then it also contains lysozyme. And the lysozyme is something that can lyse bacterial cell walls. So there's a couple of important things in saliva that are antimicrobial. Now let's talk a little bit about the salivary glands, those glands that produce saliva. The ones we see in this diagram are the parotid gland, the submandibular gland here, and the sublingual gland. Now those are what are called the major salivary glands. We also have minor salivary glands scattered throughout the oral cavity, but for the most part, the majority of the saliva is produced by the major salivary glands that we're looking at here. Now the parotid glands you'll see are large, kind of triangular shaped glands that are right in front of the ear. They have a duct that opens adjacent to the molars in the top of the oral cavity. And these produce the bulk of the saliva that we use for digesting food along with the submandibular glands. So these produce a watery kind of saliva that's rich in amylase, the enzyme that we just talked about that begins the digestion of complex carbohydrates. Whereas the sublingual glands mainly produce kind of a thick stringy type mucus. As we looked at before, when we looked at the oral cavity, remember we have the opening of the sublingual and submandibular glands here beneath the tongue. 
And as I mentioned before, the parotid gland opens adjacent to the second molar on the upper jaw. So let's talk a little bit more about the secretions of salivary glands. The secretions, as we said, are around neutral pH and are more or less continual due to basal parasympathetic stimulation, but they increase after several different things. They increase after the presence or anticipation of food, especially when we're hungry. As that increases after we take in food, these glands produce a large amount of watery saliva. Something that actually decreases salivary production is sympathetic stimulation. And so these two things here increase saliva production. Sympathetic stimulation decreases it and causes a viscous type, small volume of saliva to be secreted. Now the parotid glands, as we mentioned before, these are the primary salivary glands. These produce a watery serous fluid that's very rich in amylase. So this contains a high amount of the enzyme that will begin digesting complex carbohydrates. This is also the site where the mumps virus attacks. The submandibular glands, once again, these produce a high amount of amylase. They primarily secrete a serous fluid similar to the parotid glands. So after we eat, these are the two main salivary glands that are going to produce a large volume of watery type saliva. And then finally, we have the sublingual glands. And as I mentioned before, these produce primarily a mucus secretion, which is very viscous. So during that fight or flight reaction, when we predominate with sympathetic stimulation, we'd expect saliva to go away and just have a mucus stringy type saliva left in the mouth. This is why when we have sympathetic stimulation and we get in those type emergency situations, your mouth seems to be dry. Okay, let's move on and talk about the pharynx. We've talked about the oral cavity, about the tongue, the teeth, and the salivary glands. Now we're gonna move back and talk about the pharynx. You'll notice that the pharynx is designed to aid swallowing by grasping food and then moving it down toward the esophagus, which is here. And the esophagus, as we'll see, is the passageway that goes down to the stomach. At the lower left, you'll see a nice diagram that gives you the different sections of the pharynx and highlights them in a different color. So we see the nasopharynx here, the oropharynx at the back of the oral cavity, and finally the laryngopharynx that's in the vicinity of the larynx. Now, once again, you see the nasopharynx here, and remember that this piece of soft tissue right here, the back of the soft palate, we call the uvula, and this is what moves upward during swallowing to prevent any movement of food back into the nasopharynx. The oropharynx is the next section down. As we said, this is the back of the oral cavity. So once we swallow, food is passed into the oropharynx, and then it's directed by the pharynx downward into the laryngopharynx. And that's the next section of the pharynx, which is just adjacent to the larynx that's down here. And then, of course, after the laryngopharynx, inferiorly, this begins the esophagus, which is a muscular tube that leads down to the stomach. Now, let's talk a little bit about swallowing. There are three phases of swallowing. However, only the first is voluntary. In other words, only the first is the one that we have any conscious control over. And that first phase is known as the buccal or oral phase of swallowing. So once we have the food in our mouth and we feel like it's appropriate to swallow, we make the decision to consciously move the food toward the back of the oral cavity and into the oropharynx. That's our voluntary part of the swallowing reflex. Next, what happens is the soft palate and the uvula raise. This is more or less a kind of an involuntary reaction. The hyoid bone and the larynx elevate. Epiglottis closes off the top of the trachea. And then finally, the longitudinal muscles of the pharynx contract. Now, all of these things that we just talked about are part of what we refer to as the pharyngeal phase of swallowing. This is, once again, a reflexive phase. Following this, the food is moved inferiorly. The inferior constrictor muscles of the pharynx relax. The esophagus begins to open and we have peristaltic waves begin to push the food through the pharynx and into the esophagus. This is known as the esophageal phase of swallowing. And I'll make a note once again that both of these, remember, are reflexive. The only voluntary phase of swallowing that we have is the buccal or oral phase. This is just a diagram of swallowing. This is a nice uh, view of what exactly happens. We're gonna make a decision to swallow here. This is a bolus of food or basically a mass of food that's been tied together, remember, by the saliva. And we make a conscious decision to force with the tongue upward to the roof of the mouth, which enables this food to move backwards. And this is going to eventually move it back to the oropharynx back here. And once the food goes to the oropharynx, we have the reflexive portion of swallowing occurring. Here we would have the pharyngeal phase, 
and you notice that the bolus of food is moved to the back and once again as we said the soft palate hyoid bone larynx are raised and the tongue is continued to be pressed back this way to move the food down the next phase which you see in item C down here is the esophageal phase and you notice that now we're starting to move the food from the oropharynx into the laryngopharynx and then further inferiorly down into the esophagus so this is the esophageal phase and you notice what happens in the esophagus which we really haven't talked about yet we have peristaltic contractions that will take this bolus of food and move it inferiorly or aborally down toward the stomach once it reaches near the stomach as we'll talk about later on we have a sphincter down near the stomach that relaxes temporarily allows the bolus of food to pass into the stomach and then the sphincter will tighten up to prevent any kind of reflux back into the esophagus okay so that finishes off part two of lecture 910 i will see you next time for the third part of lecture 910